we as a degrowthers are thinking, feeling, and building a different society. For this reason, during, during the transition, we will not simply struggle for a linear socio-economic system, no? as we don't simply struggle for a linear elephant. As Federico said, um, my part will be a sort of introduction to our book, so I will try to not to marketize too much our work, that is not just our work, because there are 51 contributions, 51 entries, so 51 uh, participants to this collective uh, and amazing work. Uh, as you can see here, basically there are some concepts that, that are very, very central uh, if you look at it from different perspectives. And of course, the biggest is growth. So the critics of growth is a very central point of uh, the growth narrative. But of course, they are also uh, positive, let's say. Um, uh, items, and uh, you can see, like, the, the most interesting for me is care, but also commons, metabolism, and so on. Uh, of course, I cannot go in deep in the entries. Uh, what I can do is try to, at least, uh, to introduce you uh, to the general themes uh, that we used to synthesize the 51 entries that each contributor uh, prepare for, for the vocabulary. Uh, the themes are um, five, as you can see, so the limits to, of growth, and of course this is, um, uh, is let's say, uh, organized around the critics of growth, the critics of commodification, the critics of GDP, and so on and so far. Also, it's important degrowth as autonomy, or degrowth and autonomy, because autonomy is a very central concept. It's a one of the main core concepts for the, our vocabulary. Um, degrowth as a repolitization, because we argue that one of the problematics, um, point of sustainable development, for example, just to give a a conceptual uh, context is the depolitization of the debate that he built. Then degrowth and capitalism, because our companions, Marxist, always attacks to us to be not clear enough about uh, our thought uh, concerning capitalism. And then uh, a proposal for a degrowth transition that is based on basically uh, a coherent look at uh, the grassroots practices uh, that are um, not only um, described in the vocabulary, but uh, uh, they are the very practical activity that the growers does in their everyday life. So the limits to growth, um, as I said, is basically um, related to the, the critics of growth. And one of the critics is uh, the growth is an economic. We will see growth is unjust, growth is ecologically unsustainable. Growth is an economic is basically uh, related to the fact that the point that Daly raised in the past in his book, Beyond the Growth, that the benefits um, increase um, not faster enough to, to match with the cost that are increasing faster and faster in our society. And, and this is, can also synthesize in terms of the increasing of the cost against wealth. And what is important is also the point of inequality. Um, this is a point that now, I mean, uh, our companion, Thomas Piketty, a very uh, important economist, raised in his book, The Capital, that he is showing is not one of us, but now is one of 
our biggest allies in the economic field. Because it's at least repeating and it's showing why and how inequality is increasing in our market society and capitalist society. And also he uh, stressed that we, as we does uh, uh, the problematic of the concentration of wealth. The point that I want to uh, just underline now is that uh, even if uh, growth is an economic, it doesn't mean that it cannot go on. Exactly because the, um, the concentration of wealth is related to also to concentration of power. Mm. And so even if it's an economic, we can go on on doing the same things. Because the benefit, even if they increase not fast enough to match the costs, are, uh, let's say, grasped by very few people. And so they can concentrate wealth, and they can go on with their political socioeconomic system. Then growth is unjust, and here uh, you have a convergence of different kind of uh, lines of thought. The first is basically, we can say, our companion Marxist about the critics of commodification, but also Polanyi criticize a lot the process of marketization of a sphere of society in issues that were out of the market before. Then the problem of unequal access to resources that is underlined together with unequal distribution of cost and benefit by the environmental justice literature. Then we have the, let's say, feminist economics uh, approach that um, since the 70s, uh, is trying to, to show up the number of the unpaid cost and the unpaid work of uh, the society that are basically uh, the work that um, mainly female are in charge of in our society. That in terms of time is more than the paid work in all the developed society. Then the fact that also the old literature that use different indicators in terms of welfare economics and showing that happiness and welfare is decreasing or, uh, or is basically in stagnation since the 70s, even if the GDP increased. Then ecological and sustainable growth. This is, a, a, let's say, the critiques coming from the, the, the fa showing number and the empirical work, using empirical work that uh, there is still a strong correlation between G GDP and CO2 emission, uh, that the, the, the materialization is not happening, at, at, least, at least in terms of absolute dematerialization. De and the fact that uh, there is a, a, a problematic, uh, mm, let's say, block of the technological uh, improvement of the uh, society, that it's not able to uh, solve all the problems that the growth is creating. Sometimes this part of literature related to technology also show that the increasing the efficiency, uh, and this is called in, in the literature Jevons paradox, uh, basically increase the use of resources and not the other way around. So the, the advancement of technology in a capitalist system normally increase, even if uh, per unit uh, is more efficient, in total uh, increase the use of resources. Then there is the other aspect, the other, uh, let's say, sub-team of the limits to growth, that this growth is coming to an end, and this is... Uh, this has a different kind of uh, approach. Uh, we can divide basically in uh, an economic, uh, in economic approach or biophysical approach. So economic discussion is about the diminishing marginal returns of uh, capital, the uh, exhaustion of technological innovation. Uh, and from Marxist uh, Harvey, for example, in 
is uh, limits to capital uh, um, underline the fact that uh, there is a limit in creating effective demands and investment outlets. Um, from a biophysical uh, uh, approach, we can say that uh, there is a limit in natural resource. There is all the discussion about peak oil and peak uh, of resources, like phosphorus of very important other resources that are central for uh, our uh, society. And also the problematics that uh, we are living in. Federico and myself as Italian, uh, with the, the huge depth, indebtedness of our society. But, I mean, it's not just a matter of Italy. Uh, as we know, the sum of the public and private uh, indebtedness of the USA is the biggest in the world. So also the problematic of debt creates problems for, for uh, increasing growth. And so the growth could come to an end. Then we uh, we, I, I will pass to the second team, that is degrowth as autonomy. I cannot follow my notes at all, but uh, no. Um, okay, auto I'm, I'm not an expert on autonomy. Also, I have a problem because I like to be dependent of the people. Um, uh, but ba basically, we, we, we know that uh, uh, there is at least a different kind of meanings uh, coming out of the discussion uh, uh, about autonomy. Um, basically, I will start with Gortz because I think it's uh, the easiest to grasp. Gortz basically, for him, means autonomy means uh, um, to be free from wage labor. So. For him, um, gaining autonomy for the society at large means to decommodify a lot of, of basically, a lot of activity that we now uh, do for the market. Then there is Ivan Illich that uh, um, interpret, uh, interpret, interprets uh, autonomy as um, basically autonomy from a complex technological system. For this, one of the most important uh, book of him about autonomy is uh, the book um, that describes describe the concept of conviviality. And so he, he also developed all, all the discourse about convivial tools. Uh, and this is a very big critique that is uh, part of uh, the sources of uh, degrowth now about the complex technological system that also Jacques Ellul criticized in the 70s. And then there is a, uh, the, um, the meaning that uh, Cornelius Castoriadis, Castoriadis, I think, I don't know if some Greek uh, uh, can correct me, uh, give to autonomy. And, and this is basically related to the institution, and so also to the institution of the society. And the Castoriadis means basically, uh, with the Castoriadis means basically, uh, with autonomy, uh, the self determination of the institution in a society. So the ability to determine our own institution, the institution that we are part of. But even if Basically, we have three different approach and meanings. Uh, I, I think the, the, these three discourses about autonomy has something, have something uh, in common that are important. The fact that they describe about limits as a social choice, so not as a catastrophic discourse or impending disaster uh, that forces us to behave in some way or in another, let's say, not as, uh, we can say, example of Al Gore in his inconvenient truth when asked to us to change our behavior because it's impending the CO2 emission and the, uh, the carbon catastrophe. These people are, on the contrary, saying that the limits is a social choice 
and we are not determined by the external uh, factor. What I can add is that if we are determined by external factor, we are uh, entangled in a depolitization discourse. Because of course, there is something outside of us that forced us to change, but not a political vision that uh, forced us to change or encourage us to change. And this is the importance of also on the, not on the self-limitation of the individual, but the fact that all these three discuss of a collective self-limitation. And Castoriadis clarified this, but uh, I think uh, for, for, um, for the other two authors, uh, Illich uh, and Gortz was clear too. So De Groot, and I introduced a little bit before, De Groot has a repolitization. Uh, exactly, now at the beginning, a lot of people underlined the fact that uh, um, De Groot was a missile world, uh, a stone, uh, dangerous uh, tools that we have in, in hand uh, to repoliticize, repoliticize environmentalism and also fake, then the fake consensus about sustainable development, but also about uh, the narrative of climate change nowadays. Um, the, this repolitization is basically very central uh, for us, and uh, it concerns not only, let's say, the po social political debate, but also the science. Uh, and, for, um, and for this, one of our, let's say, companion, um, that work with us is the post-normal science approach that is trying in some way to uh, politicize the science against the te uh, technocratization of politics. No? Uh, also in some way to debunk the expert, to debunk uh, the, the scientist. Um, and then the other aspect is a, a player for the pants that uh, is the epilogue, let's say, of our dictionary, uh, the, a collective uh, determination of the use of surplus that each society um, produces uh, in different kind of context. Then uh, we came to the fourth team. Okay. Uh, degrowth and capitalism. And, and as, I, as I said, it was uh, some way forced to us to discuss about capitalism by our companion Marxists that uh, want uh, a clear position about capitalism. And even if for me it was uh, uh, enough clear, we clarify it in the, in the book this time. And our, our idea is basically, our thesis is basically that uh, growth is an imperative for capitalism for two reasons. Uh, we accept the first, uh, let's say, um, a reason that the Marxists basically developed is the technical economic reason. So the fact that the capital um, for increase, uh, it's cap capital as a social system for is forced to increase uh, uh, the accumulation of capital, so it's forced to expand the economic system. But w what is important for us, and uh, I will underline a little bit more, this aspect is the social political reason. I mean, growth is an imperative because basically, uh, thanks to the growth, uh, the lib you have nowadays, we have nowadays the neoliberal consensus. The fact that the growth was realized all around developed society and now is coming also in so-called undeveloped countries, they gain, let's say, the ideological debate about, and, and they also avoid uh, basically the redistributive conflict of the production, claiming that the fact that we are increasing, then there will be a trickle-down effort that will allow to all the people to gain and increase their access to resources and well-being. And exactly because 
uh, this uh, ideological aspect is very important to maintain the society as it is now. Uh, the growth is an imperative for all the political elite and socioeconomic elites all around the world. Because if the growth is not realized, probably, and very probably, and we are ready for that, uh, redistributive conflict will rise again as in 19th and 20th centuries. So basically, uh, we can synthesize, and we will see now in the last part of my presentation, uh, the growth is about imagining and constructing or, or something that is already in the process of being uh, built, a non-capitalist society. And all the nautopias are the very practices on which we are looking for and we are participating in to develop a non-capitalist society. And now I come to the last part of my presentation. Not exactly the last, but I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost there. So uh, the fifth theme that we, de uh, we developed in the introduction of the book was a, a sort of proposal for a degrowth transition. And this is based basically on uh, um, on four aspects, so the grassroots economic practices, so the nautopia, the welfare institution without growth, the money great credit institution that are blooming, the politics of the growth transition. So the characteristics, I mean, I can list nautopias like uh, eco-communities, urban gardening, uh, housing, um, transition town in some part of them. But what is interesting perhaps now is also to, to, to look at the characteristic of, uh, of uh, these nautopias. And this, basically, the difference, as we know, uh, in a market system, we have the pro uh, production for exchange value and production for use value. What you can see is that in Nautopia, the production for use value is the prevalent. Uh, of course, you don't delete the production for exchange value, but uh, what fosters you in, uh, in your activity is basically the production of use value for the community and society and neighborhood. Then, is, for this reason, it's not built in, an, uh, in the dynamic of accumulate and expand. So it's basically it's not a capitalist approach to the production and consumption system. Uh, normally, uh, there is a reduction of wage labor because a different kind of activity and uh, possibility to participate and to be part of the nautopias um, are different and are not always related to a wage, then the circulation is not a, an exchange, but uh, is related to the, what we know as a gift economy, so in, basically on reciprocity, and so also on uh, um, a very anti-utilitarian, let's say, uh, logic, and not utilitarian one. And then there is, of course, the commoning aspect of it. So, um, the fact that nautopias are related to, not just to, pro to the production, but also to reset the institution that allows production, consumption, redistribution. And so the commoning is a complex process of being in uh, community. Then we have also the welfare institution without growth. Uh, and basically, we have different kind of um, instruments. Uh, here, I, I, I will speak about uh, three. Basically, job guarantee. That is, um, basically, is the idea that the state will be uh, uh, the, su the supply of last resort of work. So for the, all the unemployed, uh, the state will create, it um, will give them a job. And this can be related all to what we can call uh, the care, not of private context, but also social context. So all the unpaid, normally unpaid work that now 
is the very big burden of women, basically, in society. Then the other uh, tools is the, um, the use, the couple use of basic income and uh, maximum income or ceiling, maximum income, so um, a, a taxation on the top of um, salary per year. And basically it's not a very revolutionary, um, let's say, Proposal. You can think that in the 1950s uh, is an hour, so not a leftist. In USA, uh, had the taxation up to $200,000 uh, per year, up to 98%. So every dollar that was earned in the 50s under Eisenhower in USA was taxed at 1980%. Uh, and this is, of course, associated to a basic income. So uh, it's, I can avoid to say something about this because it's a very clear concept that also is part of a political debate. And then there is also the work sharing. So the fact that we uh, can share um, not only space of work, but also the hour of work with unemployed. And this is also a way to, to give a, a sort of a, um, solution to the unemployment uh, problem. Then there is money, money and credit institution um, practices, and this is basically community currencies. That is a way, this, this also is, a, is increasing a lot. Uh, during, before, during, and after the crisis. Um, a lot of community currencies we have in Europe, but also in, in Latin America. And it's basically uh, a way to, the, to um, let's say, re-territorialize re the uh, production and the resources that uh, is in circulation in a certain territory. Then uh, the discussion about public money, the fact that the state basically has to regain the power on, uh, on the supply of, uh, of the money, and so take it back from the private banks. And then also the, um, the debt audits, that was a practice uh, coming out uh, above all in Spain after the, or during the Indignados movement, that was basically uh, a collective way uh, from bottom up to understand what really means uh, the debt in Spain, uh, who are the creditors, who are the debitors, to have a selective take on it. So to, to, to decide a jubilee for some of this debt and to repay back some of the other. And for example, I will say that we are, we should be with the young Minister of Economy of Argentina that is trying to avoid the way back to the hedge fund of Americans. That is exactly the kind of, ju uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, jubilee that we sh should uh, support. So we support uh, the Minister of Economy in Argentina they have not to pay the hedge funds of USA. Well, basically then we have the, the politics of transition, and we, we developed uh, with Federico, Claudio Cattani, and myself, this idea of uncivil and civil practices. Um, and we focus basically on the uncivil practices of uh, the growers. Uh, with uncivil, we basically mean uh, practices, individual and networks that are not uh, governmentalized by the idea of uh, doing things for create what is called the social capital. And so to make a, a new valorization of what they do uh, in their everyday practices. And with Uncivil, of course, we have a financial disobedience, 
uh, one of our friends in, in Barcelona, for example, uh, Duran, Eric Duran, that um, with this financial disobedience uh, refused to give back 500,000 euros to banks and invested in, in the social movement of Spain in Catalonia. Then in terms of what we can do in, uh, with, the, with the, let's say, institutional uh, parties, I, I will suggest and we suggest to, to leak to leak in parliamentary politics. So try to, uh, to, to, to convince uh, at different level from the municipality uh, to, to the European Parliament to politicians of different parties to uh, focus and to implement some of the policies that we have to show, that, we have, uh, that I, have to sh I have showed before, like uh, basic and ceiling income or uh, trying to fight back uh, and um, the, um, the supply of public money. And then the last part is, of course, is taking part of social movement. This is a constituent part of uh, the growth's pra practices, and we have to go on, on doing this. Then this is the really final part, and this is related basically to, uh, to what it was a suggestion to, let's say, younger uh, than me, uh, researcher, uh, that together with us can develop new new line of research on, let's say, foundational claims of the growth, but uh, that are still not uh, um, convincing enough uh, in the academia um, context. And this is about uh, the impossibility of the materialization. No? That the debate is still there, and still we have to, to show that uh, what we claim that, that, that the materialization is not possible. Um, we still have to convince our uh, colleagues. Um, the same is um, the fact that basically we are not saying this. Because, I mean, very important economists are saying that uh, developed economies are entering in a period of systemic stagnation. Um, but we have still convinced the others that uh, are not convinced about this, that the stagnation is there and will not go uh, out. And then for this could, could be like... A, um, the fact idea, we always say that uh, if we abandon the growth, imaginary, the growth society, there will be a revival of politics and, uh, and nourishment of democracy, but we have to, in some way, demonstrate it. We claim that it's true, will be true, but we are, we are not sure it will be, uh, of course, can be a different kind of results, like a more authoritarian uh, community, uh, and we have a lot of this emergency all around um, South Europe nowadays, like in Greece is an example of uh, fascist uh, parties that are uh, taking the power. So, well, the future of the growth is in your and our hands, and we will do our best to, to show how different and why we are different from them. Thank you very much.